Um, our next uh, set of questions are, are around the municipal uh, role. Um, and I'm gonna ask this question, I'm gonna invite uh, Craig uh, to start with an answer, then Kristen, then Cheryl. Um, what are the chief challenges for municipalities in addressing the housing crisis and how can these be overcome? What measures exist for municipalities to address the housing crisis during this particular pandemic and beyond? What are some of the examples of leading practices with municipalities across Canada and internationally? Craig, you have the Montreal experience, why don't you can start? Thank you so much. Uh, just to start off, just a, a real pleasure to be uh, connecting with a great group of activists and such an illustrious panel in the Toronto area. It's, it's a real pleasure for us uh, in Montreal to make, make contacts like this. Um, it's a good question. I think it's super important to uh, bring this up. Uh, and I think Kristen did a good job of, of sort of starting to touch off on this, that all cities are not necessarily created equal. We look at, we mentioned Berlin before, they're actually a province in, in, in Germany, they're a state and they have a lot more legislative power. And some other cities in the United States and Canada, we have different legislative frameworks. And even within Canada, within the provinces, there are different legislative frameworks for the cities. So there's certain powers that some cities have that other cities might not. Um, so it's important that we, we recognize that when we start talking about what can the municipalities do because Kristen said it, we need all three levels really to work well and in the same direction in order to get the most amount done. So, and for the Montreal, I thought I'd bring a little Montreal perspective in it. We did get some recently devolved powers in 2017 that allowed us to have a lot more rights within housing and planning. Uh, and we'll talk about this later. I'm sure you'll want to talk about our right of first refusal, um, which is something as a tool we're using in Montreal now. Um, and that's something that we had to be legislated for us by Quebec. Um, but there are a number of other <clears throat> strategies that we're putting forward. Uh, we've just uh, passed a very strong uh, zoning inclusion bylaw, and uh, this bylaw may be amongst the, the strongest in North America, um, making 20% social ho housing obligatory or financing for 20%, uh, including really good options for land seeding and trying to incite people to hand over the land or to build turnkey social housing. There's an affordable submarket housing component as well, and a family uh, component as well, family housing, so three bedrooms or more. And that'll be obligatory for all development uh, starting in April 1st. So something that's very strong that we're using in Montreal to bake in future affordability. But of course, we need to act right now. We are facing housing crises and a pandemic crisis across the, across the country. Um, so land buys are really important. That's something Montreal is doing is purchasing a lot of land in order to build more de decommodified housing. Uh, we've put $50 million for the, next, uh, for the past few years. We've already spent about two thirds of that uh, for this mandate uh, and then over the next uh, couple of years after we've already budgeted for 108 million dollars uh, also and land is expensive so that's small but it's still a, a really good piece of it we've also created an innovation fund for affordable housing that doesn't fit into the provincial or the federal pr programs so the montreal can directly fund uh, housing initiatives that might not fit into other programs and another thing we've done in montreal is to try to improve the quality of life for people who are already renting right now. So we've really boosted the amount of inspectors we've had uh, for housing sanitation and given them better tools and more tools to work more efficiently uh, and uh, to, to do more to do more of that, the, the work that we need to make sure that our housing stock is in good shape and that people are respected. But overall, I'd say, I think we're talking about the same thing. And uh, I think control of land is something that I've I fleshed out as one of the main uh, arguments uh, written in the paper uh, that was submitted by Mr. Albioso Cahill. And I think that's uh, something that cities have to be pushing for, try to get more uh, socialized land, more uh, decommodified land. Great, thank you very much. Just before uh, Kristen starts, um, I would be reading this if I didn't uh, advise you of this. There is at the bottom of your screen, there's a little section called Q&A. If you have a question that you have or a concern or a support that you want to uh, indicate, please, uh, in the, please put it in the Q&A section at the bottom to, to all of the 117 participants that have uh, joined this uh, this session. We want you part of the conversation and we will have, a, there are some folks who are gonna be collating some of these questions and concerns and we will have a chance at the end, towards the end of the meeting uh, and, um, and panel to uh, to basically address them. Um, Kristen, over to you, the Toronto, the Tor what can Toronto do around the housing uh, crisis? 
Uh, Joe, this is a, an excellent question and one that I think um, many people are struggling uh, to find an answer uh, to, to, uh, and strive to, to get to outcomes. Um, and, and largely, I think that the conversation around housing at the municipal level has, has been a little bit uh, late to the table. Um, and it has a lot to do with um, uh, Martine's point that uh, you know housing was always seen uh, largely as a federal responsibility, especially when it comes to social housing, uh, federally uh, capitalized and and, uh, and and helped build, uh, and oftentimes with the support of the province. Uh, when those two big actors uh, left that field, um, it was there. There really was a void, and I don't think the city of Toronto. Uh, has ever fully stepped into it, thinking it would be uh, an exclusive city of Toronto, Toronto responsibility. I doubt very much uh, any urban center thought it was their uh, sole responsibility to build housing just because of, uh, of, of the financial instruments that are available to, to cities, uh, because of the, 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 uh, the lack of, of, of ability to finance from beginning to end acquisition, build uh, delivery uh, operation. Uh, it's, it's significant, um, which is why probably it has not been done. Uh, there is oftentimes um, uh, a, a, a proposal put forward uh, by municipalities and sometimes by provincial governments that if the federal government steps in, uh, then so will the province. And if the province steps in, then so will the city. So we're always looking for that tripartite um, uh, arrangement. Um, but when it doesn't exist, and when you're when you're gripped with a housing crisis as Toronto has been uh, for the past few years, and definitely magnified during COVID, uh, all bets are off. And now everyone is talking about housing. It is the the big issue uh, in 2020, uh, but it was not the big issue uh, when uh, when I first took office in 2010. Uh, subways and transit was. And so if, if a municipality speaks about the need to expand transit, and if that's what the mayor wants, then guess what? The province and the federal government will come to the table with transit dollars. If we start talking with one unified voice at city council that our priorities are housing and to making sure people have a dignified place to live, then the, 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 the provincial and federal conversation will shift. So that's one big piece of, of, of why I believe uh, the city of Toronto has struggled to deliver an adequate amount of housing. Uh, when Craig spoke about preeminent uh, rights, which is the first right of refusal or the inclusionary zoning, I know these are new tools to Montreal, but um, I have to tell you, I was, I was just joyful for you and a little bit envious because we don't have uh, any of those, those instruments that are available to the city. Uh, and yet we have a real uh, quote unquote hot real estate market with a lot of global capital that comes in in an extremely predatory manner, extracting as much as they want. Uh, and, it is, um, and it is apparently relatively cheap on the global scale when it comes to big urban centers. Uh, so there is this constant narrative that Toronto has this hot real estate market, but who is it hot for and who is it benefiting? Um, and, and so those are some of the, the big uh, constant brush ups. One is that we don't have the, the powers of inclusionary zoning. Uh, the, the powers about expropriation, which I know we're gonna get to, uh, is not a tool that the city uh, solicitor, I will say, looks upon favorably because it comes with some mixed results. And there's a very long and painful uh, uh, legal process that one has to endure before you get to the other side. So it's, it's, it's the last resort if they, if, they, if they must use it. And that's how it's been explained to me. Uh, and then finally, the, 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 the component is that we're also battling and, and, and competing in market forces where we're, ba we're basically trying to wrestle real estate out of the hands of major global capital that perform as benevolent um, uh, actors in the form of REITs, the Real Estate Investment Trust. And, and, and cities don't always want to compete in that space because they don't think that they should do it. And there's a neoliberal uh, attitude that we don't want to interfere with the market. I don't agree. I think we should regulate. I think we should interfere. We should disrupt. But that's not the will of the majority of council, as you know. Uh, and and I'm, I'm speaking to Joe in particular. Joe, you know this one very well. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Kristen. Cheryl, your perspective on uh, the role of municipalities and what they can and cannot do. So the role of municipalities, I think, would be to to do the first step, which is to engage community adequately. I think 
um, the role of engagement is not just about kind of the fuzzy feelings you get from talking to people. It's the, the ability for community to hold um, planners and politicians accountable. Um, and so you see that, for example, in the Regent Park case where there was a really extensive engagement process and the community is now the ones who's going to the council and going to um, planners and asking for the results. Um, and, and so I know the city of Toronto is one example is looking at being a more uh, inclusive in their, in their planning process. They just recently released their missing middle open uh, opportunities for housing report in which they acknowledge that the history of planning for single detached housing in the city of Toronto has um, been at a, um, you know, at the detriment of marginalized communities such as black and indigenous communities, as well as um, I would add women. Um, so that's the first step and in acknowledging that that allows for them to, to build out a path for having more meaningful conversations with folks. Um, you know, it was mentioned by Martine about, um, you know, financialization. Kristen also mentioned this as well. You know, it's important to note that um, just over the course of the pandemic, that the top 20 richest billionaires have raised 37, they're $37 billion richer and the 10 year national housing plan is a $40 billion plan. That's at the federal level, right? $40 billion for a 10 year national housing plan, 20 billionaires, $37 billion over six, seven months. Um, and so those are the types of questions that, you know, some might say to me it's outside of my scope as an urban planner, but it's not, right? How do we plan these? How do we finance these decisions? We're, we're gonna talk about rent control. We're gonna talk about building new housing. We're gonna talk about uh, taking housing out of the market. We need to be able to talk to communities so they are prepared to make those requests of our politicians. Um, and we actually really need to be talking to, um, you know, developers and asking them, where is your voice in this conversation, right? I would love to have had this panel with Tridel, you know, saying saying these things and, or another one of those, um, our, um, you know, these, the REITs talking about, you know, yeah, we're, we're kind of getting away with a lot right now. And, um, you know, it's just really easy for us to, to do that because we're not being held uh, accountable at the scale that which we need to. We have, you know, great politicians like Kristen at the local level, we have a provincial level, great politicians, but what planning really needs to do is to be able to go out and to get people more involved politically. And one of the first steps to get people involved politically and to understand, um, you know, their, their, their potential is to engage them in planning processes, engage them in conversations as small as, you know, what do you think about your um, your rental building, and what do you what would you like to see change there? Like that's one of the things that I'm doing uh, right now in uh, Eglinton Avenue West. Uh, actually, your former uh, ward, Joe, is um, I recently won a CMHC grant where I'm working with tenants to talk about affordable housing, um, and the current the current councilor, um, Joe is a, uh, he's, he's a great guy. And so we'll be, I'm looking to collaborate with his office to work with the tenants to put forward affordable housing as a priority. And so what sometimes is the issue is that within the city planning offices, there is this dynamic where they're extremely risk averse to having some of those conversations about taking land out the market or having an innovative approach to, you know, reshaping the way that planning is done. Um, I, I've heard directly from the community members actually that they've been pushing for affordable housing and, and other topics to be prioritized in the area for five years now. And that hasn't been put on the agenda. It's been put on the back burner. Only now, uh, due to the current counselor, is that being put on the agenda as something to focus on. Um, and in part, I, I believe it's also because that community has been able to get uh, you know, the help of myself um, we're soon to have some Waterloo students and some Ryerson students to really push, push the agenda so that, you know, if the city's not tying up along with us, then they're not going to look, they're not going to be, you know, part of the conversation. And I know that planners love to be a part of the conversation. Um, and what, so the way that that happens is through partnerships. So finding ways to partner between cities and, um, you know, agencies outside of the city who are interested in pushing these agendas so that we can have the conversations that we need, so we can get the taxes and so we can get policies um, 
enacted, one policy I can throw out there that I think is really uh, a great model for how we can see affordable housing built and on a small scale, you know, there's all kinds of scales of affordable housing creation, but on a small scale, um, the city of Toronto recently supported for laneways to be constructed. Um, and there's a policy that says that if you build this laneway house as affordable housing, we will provide a $50,000 forgivable loan if you maintain it as affordable for a set duration of time. So there are these incentives that are available right now um, that we need to, that we are able to implement um, and what, to implement them and to, 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 to install them, we need to have a, a proper process. Great, thank you very much, uh, Cheryl. Good, good work that you're doing in uh, my uh, former ward.